Um, where am I? At? Verse verse 24. And then let's let's skip down to verse 27. And here's the point. Verse 27, he's talking about this new life and give no opportunity to who? Now, we've looked at that word. Topos is the Greek word here. And it means to set up a place designed for someone to live there. It's, a, it's an opportunity. In other words, what Paul is saying is do not give any place for the devil don't allow the devil to set up a residency in your heart, in your life, in your family, in your church, in, in your devotion to God. There's nothing should become between you and God. Don't allow anything to be set up. Don't allow any demonic activity, any lifestyle to be set up in your life, to take residency in your heart, in your life, at lifestyle, whether it's habitual things or just a, a, just a, a matter of choice for that day. Don't allow anything to give opportunity to give. And by the way, it's important implied for a command. In other words, you do not give an opportunity. It's up to you to make that choice. Now, hang on to that. We're going to kind of just layer this thing out, this teaching this morning. All right? So, the first thing I want to say is demons cannot enter any time they choose. So, how do demons enter? There must be an opened door. Write this down. The next one. Demons dwell where access is given. Write that down. Okay. Let me kind of explain this because we're going to use this a lot. So, so the kingdom of darkness looks for what we're going to call open doors. Okay? We're not going to find that in Scripture but we're going to kind of play this out a little bit because I'm going to tell you why at the end. So, so the kingdom of darkness looks for what we call open doors. Now listen to me. Listen, church. This is important. Satan has no authority to demonize a believer unless he gives legal access into any area of your life. And how do you give legal access? In other words, you come in agreement. That's a covenant. You come in agreement with the devil. You come in agreement with his lies. Uh, of those things that he tempts you with. You just come in agreement and say, like, if, if the devil comes in with condemnation, we know that that's, a, that's not of God, right? There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. But when the devil condemns you and you just kind of bind it, yeah, I am a sorry dog. Yeah, I'm no good. I'm not loved by God. And when we agree with that, when we say, well, you know, I don't think God loves me anymore because of this, that's a lie from the devil, right? And when you come and agree with that, you open that door. And that's the only way as believers that, that you can be demonized when you open those doors and you give access unto him. And it's your choice. That makes sense? Makes sense? Go with me? Okay. And so here's what I believe. I, I think to believe and to agree with the devil's lies is to make an agreement and rights for him to have access into your life. Now what's this? There are sometimes, I just said something, that's your choice. There are sometimes in life, and this is where it really gets unfair. There are sometimes in our life that we didn't make those choices. Right? It just, it just happened. Good example, children. Children do not choose their parents, obviously. You know? I wouldn't have been chosen, probably, my children. You know? I, I, that guy, he's too busy. But children don't choose it. And so sometimes they are born into bad situation where there's abuse and there's neglect and there's drug addiction. And because of that, they're affected by those things, right? You understand what I'm saying? So sometimes it happens, and we're going to talk about this, and we've talked a little bit about it. I'm going to explain that just a little bit more. But, but sometimes those don't. But most of the time... It's our choices, right? It's our choices, and there are consequences to that. Demons are legalistic. You know, they, they, they can't operate outside their authority because they've been stripped of all authority through the blood of Jesus Christ. But their authority comes because they're, 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 only, they're only legalized because we allow them and we choose that in our life. And most of y'all are probably sitting there and saying, well, I would never choose that, but we do. And we're just exposing that. I want to show you a few ways that we've done that. We've kind of looked at those because we know that the power and the authority of Jesus Christ has stripped all of, of any dynamic activities and, and authority over our life. They're stripped until we open those doors, okay? 
Therefore, I think it's important that we do not ignore, we remain ignorant, and that's what we've been talking about, about these open doors of curses and demonic activity. We looked at two last Sunday. You remember what they were? Habitual sins. Are they in your notes? They are. Look. Are you all okay out there? You all are real quiet today. You know? The quieter you are, the longer it takes me to preach. Okay. And so... <laughs> So, so we looked at a couple of things, habitual sins, and we're not going to really go over that. And the second one was familiar spirits. I asked you a question. How many of y'all ever heard of familiar spirits? And this is about 50% of y'all said, yeah, we've heard about that. Familiar spirits are those, those demonic spirit, spirits in, in our uh, history, in our lives, in our family lives of, of past that knows the weaknesses uh, and tendencies that we tend to lean toward, Right. We look at families that have a history of alcoholism, and then we say, well, you know, our family has that, so we've got to really watch that. You kind of understand what I'm saying. Those are called familiar spirits. That word familiar in Latin means a family household servant. Now think about this. A, a household servant is somebody who knows your appetites, who knows your, your weaknesses, who knows the things you like, the things you don't like, the things that get your attention. Somebody who lives with you and serves you knows all those things about your life and your family, right? You know what I mean? Okay? And so this is what familiar spirits do. They, they live among us and they're watching. They don't, they don't read your mind, but they hear your words. They watch your action. They go, that's a problem in the fine family. And that's been a generational curse. We talked about that last Sunday. And so they familiarize that because they live among us. And so how do we deal with those familiar spirits? And that's where we, we kind of launched in this. And there's a couple of things that, that we looked at. We looked at family. We looked at familiar spirits in the family. That's addiction, disease, mental illness. Maybe your family has a lot of fears, phobias, and it, kinda, it just kind of lingers in your family lineage. The second thing we looked at is early in life. When's the most vulnerable time of your existence is your childhood when you're born? Because why? You're totally dependent on others to, to feed you, to clothe you, and also to put you in those bad environments. You know what I mean? Okay. The third thing was evil inheritance. And I want to say th three things about evil inheritance that's, that's kind of new. Would you write these words down? Write bloodline, unwanted pregnancies, and gender disappointment and confusion. I'm just going to kind of just really abbreviate some of this stuff right here. We know demons are spirits and can be passed on their evil lies and destruction. That's why the Bible talks about the sins of the father being passed from generation to generation. We looked at that. And then also we looked at the bloodline of being, being redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why the blood of Jesus is so important. That now, as in Christ, we have his blood in us. And so that, that old curse, that old nature has been broken. Because why? We've manned up and changed our life? No, it's because the blood of Jesus Christ has redeemed us, saved us, and restored us, and renewed us. And everything's different because of the power of the blood of Jesus Christ in our life. Amen? Okay, second of all, so, so if you look at this and you go, you know what, we've got a history of such and such in our bloodline, began to just to declare the promises of God for deliverance and healing that that will no longer continue in your family. And you can do that in the name of Jesus Christ, okay? Number two, unwanted pregnancies. Demons are spirits and may access the baby in the womb. You know this, don't you? We know this, and in, in, uh, uh, I think that scripture verse is there. Yes, it is Luke one forty one. Do you remember when Elizabeth she's 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 pregnant with John the Baptizer, and and Mary shows up, and and just immediately when Mary shows up, the baby begins to loop uh, loop <laughs> leap in Elizabeth's womb because she sees the Messiah. He he knows the Messiah. So listen. The, the babies in the wound are just just not just fetuses is what the, maybe the world says they are human beings and they have a soul so here's what happens when unwanted pregnancies they begin to say I don't want this baby I don't have anything to do with this baby you know when that baby comes out there's a spirit of rejection that they, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you why I put these three together and the third one is uh, what is the third one Gender disappointment. In other words, so when the, 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 you know, somebody's wanting a boy or, or a girl and they don't get what they want, they go, oh, man, we wanted a boy. 
In fact, we're going to name you a boy name, you know. And now this gender confusion, we're just not even going to tell them what they are, boy or girl. We're going to let them discover. Are you kidding me? Is this the craziest world we live in or not? Is this crazy? Do you see what we're putting on these children and these curses that we're putting on them and letting them decide whatever they want and just say, well, you know. Uh, and so now we say, well, we, what happens is, is that the, when those children are born, there's a desire for the same sex. I'm just telling you right now. And there's confusion about that. Several years I've been, I've been involved in the, in the ministry of this young lady. She, she does not live in Wembley. I don't tell stories like this. I've been involved in, in her deliverance for years. And, and what happened to her, she was born in a bad situation. This bloodline, this curse was there. Her father was a pedophile. He's in prison now because of that. And they, were, they, they abused alcohol and heroin. The mother was a stripper, and also she did heroin. When this, this, this girl was born, she was born in this, in this environment. But when she was four or five, something like that, she was taken out of that environment and put into a Christian home, prayed over, went to uh, Christian schools and all this. But I'm telling you, what I just show, showed you, those three things is what I've seen evident in this young girl's life. And there is this bondage of this bloodline and these curses that's in her life. Is it fair? It's not. Do I understand that? No, I don't understand it. But my duty is to pray over her and to speak truth over her. And every time I'm around her, I begin just to just speak over her the truth and the word of God. That's not who you are. And so right now, she's, she feels rejection. She felt everything that I just told you, rejection. She feels a gender identity. She, she doesn't know, you know, if, if, she, if she likes girls or boys. She doesn't know uh, uh, that, that she has any purpose in life. She's suicidal and, and addicted to drugs. Now, you tell me, and brought up in a Christian home since four, five, six years old, something like that. So I'm telling you these things can be broken through the blood of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, this is why it's so important. When you see somebody in, in HEB or Brookshire Brothers and they're pregnant, could you just pray for them? Don't go lay hands on them because it may be weird, you know, don't lay <laughs> hands on their stomach, you know especially if you think they're pregnant and they might not be. So don't show them, don't go there. Has that, has that ever happened, you know? Oh, when are you due? I'm not pregnant, you know. Been there. Done that. Done that, yeah. But could we just, could we just make it a promise to, to each other in this room? When you see somebody, could we just stop for a moment and speak blessings in that child's life? Could we do that in the spiritual realm? I want to commit y'all to that. You know, I've been practicing that for a long time, just to pray for somebody and, you know, just say, you know, and then there's a conversation. I say, well, blessings on you and just speak that so, so that child will know our inheritance. So uh, let's skip that next part. Let's go to, to the other doors. This, this verse is here. Another door that demonic, the demons have access is, write this down, number three, transfer of spirits. Now look up here. I want to say this again because it's real important because here's where it gets a little, little cloudy, okay, honestly. No demon has the authority to enter into a believer's life unless there is an open door, period. Okay, put a period there, right? No exception. There has to be an open door. What feeds those open doors is fear and flesh. That's what feeds those open doors. So therefore, that's what we've been talking about there. There's got to be a godly discernment and some godly wisdom and some spiritual maturity on our part to know these things, our involvement, when that's not of God and when that is of the Spirit of God because there's a lot of confusion out there. And, and the Bible tells us that there's going to be angels that look like they look like angels of light, but they're demonic in spirit. And we've got to understand this. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22, I'm hesitant to use this verse, but I think there's some implication here. Because it's talking about laying the hands, laying hands uh, of somebody being ordained into the ministry. 
and, and I understand that, but there's also this idea of laying hands. We see this all in the Old Testament, also in the New Testament, laying of hands in a good way, transfer of spirit. When we ordain someone, we lay hands on them, we pray for them. And so we see that in a good way, but we really don't see this in a negative way. But I want to point something out here about this, because what this is indicating in 1 Timothy is we've got to be very careful of ordaining men or women into the ministry when they're not of the Lord. We've got to be very careful. Because why? What's this? Because their influence in a congregation will be great and harmful to the kingdom of God. Do, do you understand that? And so we've got to be careful of who we ordain and where we're looking at. So this ideal of concept of transferring the spirit uh, by touch or getting near someone is really not, listen, is really not a clear biblical teaching. It's just not. Jesus never taught his disciples as when you lay hands or when you, or you're praying and casting out demons, but be careful because they're going to jump on you. He never said that because we don't have to operate in that fear, right? Okay, so, so that was never taught. He never commands, uh, don't, touch, don't touch somebody that had a demon spirit. He doesn't say that. So, so even though he, he doesn't say that, the other side to this transfer of spirit seems to be highly possible. When there is an open door. Do you understand that? It's conditional. So, so it's not just because you touch someone. No. It's because there's an open door in your life that could be a possibility. Does that make sense, Sam? So, so this idea of transferring spirit, we kind of get a little weird here. We kind of go, oh, you know, and I didn't understand it for all week long. I've just, I've had this on my desk and I've just let it kind of simmer like a crock pot. I've left that because I'm Baptist. We didn't talk about transferring spirits, right? You know, we, you know. We just knew that, that deacons were demons, and that's all we knew, you know. But, but we, yeah, I've let this sit here, and I said, Lord, you've got to teach me on this. And so if that's a possibility when doors are open, that, 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 that evil spirits, demonic spirit, experience, experience, spirits can be transferred, how are they? I want to give you three ways that are, that are known in the Bible. The first one is worldly sex. Yes, I said the word sex. I did say that. Write it down twice. <laughs> Let me give you a scripture verse. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes what? One body with her? For as it is written, the two shall become one flesh. Do y'all see that? Yes. Yeah. You've heard the word soul tie, and this is what this is really talking about. Soul tie is a spiritual link that, that is formed uh, when two souls have sexual intercourse. I mean, it, it's just, that's what the Bible says. You've got to understand in biblical days, there wasn't a marriage certificate that said you're a marriage. It was when you consummated that relationship that you became married partners. Y'all know that, don't you? Yeah. I just told you, just say, yeah, I knew that, Gary. I just told you. And so, so there's, there's this idea uh, that continues is that that's why the Bible says don't be unequally yoked, right? There's a reason for this, right? Is you should not marry a what? A non-believer. Why? Because that curse of unbelief will be passed on. And don't say you're going to change them either. You know, y'all understand. That's good counsel. I've told all my children, you're not going to change them. They must be a believer for you to date them. Even think about marriage. You, they ought to be a believer. Some of y'all may agree with that. Some of you don't. But you're going to have to argue God's word because that's what the Bible says there. So y'all deal with that. Y'all deal with God's word. I'm just telling you what it says here. And so, so the Bible says this in Proverbs 6.32, Whosoever commits adultery destroys his own soul. So, so what does that mean? So, so we understand that there's a connection in and sexual intercourse, and there's soul ties there, and we must guard against that. Now, by the way, what's this? In Psalms 23, it's very important what, what the Word of God says, because David committed adultery. You know that guy? And yet, he was forgiven. Why? Because God forgives, and God is able to forgive any sin. Amen? Aren't y'all glad? Amen. Oh, my God. Aren't y'all glad? Amen. Good grief, I'm glad about that. In fact, you know what it says in Psalm 23? He says, God restores, what's this? Restores my soul. 
David knew that soul tie. He sinned against God, but God healed him. And what? He restored his soul. Did y'all see that? And God can do that. But through this is the way it transfers spirits. Number two, associates. Write this down, associates. This is really simple here. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, associates. Other people, relationships. Do not be deceived. Bad company, what? Ruins good morals. You, you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you're that person or maybe you know that person was just a good kid all his life and all of a sudden he got around the round crowd, right? Now watch this. That attitude becomes actions and those actions become lifestyle. Does that make sense? We've all been there perhaps, but it's true. A good person loves God, just all of a sudden he gets around the wrong crowd and all of a sudden that influence and that transfer that transfer, that demonic influence in, in that bad crowd is, is put in that person's life. And all of a sudden, they begin to not only act that way, they begin, that's their lifestyle. That's their doctrine of who they are. And their rebellion against God becomes very obvious. Proverbs thirteen twenty says, the company of fools suffers harms, suffers harm. The last one, television media. Write this one down. You knew I was going to get to that. 1 Thessalonians 5, 22 through 24. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and whole soul and whole body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful and he will surely do it. You cannot help if you're a believer when you turn on social media or the television, our news, or whatever, this promotion and tolerance of a lifestyle of sexual impurities, right? Whether it's drag dressing, is that, is that it? Drag dressing, is that what it was? Drag dressing or cross dressing or whatever. Do you know, since if you watch commercials now, do you watch this? When there's just, you know, they're highlighting couples and all this, I guarantee you, not guarantee, most of the time, 90% of the time, you will see this promotion of same-sex relationship. Do you watch this? Are y'all geared for that? And, and, and over and over and over, this is a promotion. And, and, and there's a reason for this, you know. Look, can we just say this out loud? I don't need to be entertained. Can we all just agree? I don't need to be entertained. Can we just stop this? Who says this? I, well, I need, it's entertaining for me. You don't need to be entertained, right? Uh, some of y'all didn't like me saying that, did you? Okay. It's true. Listen, demonic doctrines are being evangelized through the media and through and, 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 and just is dismantling this God-fearing nation. Years ago, we wouldn't tolerate this. You know that, don't you? We would not. And so you know what this is? This media, this television is just a, it's a, 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 an aesthetic type of thing that just kind of calms us down because it's painful. When I watch it, I'm, I'm, I'm so in pain watching this and disgusted with this. I have a couple of scars. One of these is, is right here. Uh, it's a chainsaw. And I mean, I'm lucky to have my arm. And I'm no longer, I'm grounded from power tools from some reason. I'm not sure. But, but anyway, it's a chainsaw. And it just, man, it just years ago. And, and it's a big scar. And, and I hurt for days because you know, I didn't go to the doctor. And I didn't get you know, any painkillers or anything less. Well, I have another scar right here when I broke my neck. But I was, you know, when they did that, they gave me a lot of pain. This one didn't hurt at all. This one hurt a lot. You know why? Because I didn't have painkillers. And this is what media does. It just kind of softens the pain for, oh, it's not that bad. It's not, you know, just accept this and get over it. That's just the way that it is. No, it's not the way that it is. It's not right. Turn it off. Turn it off. Because I'm telling you, the, the demonic transfers a lot of things through the media. Number, number four, spirit of addiction. Write that down. Spirit of addiction. I, th I tell you what, I probably, without knowing everyone in this room, pretty much I know y'all, probably every single person in this room has been some way affected and harmed and hurt by this spirit of addiction, haven't we? Yeah, it's rampant. Now remember, what demon spirits do when they reside in a person, what do they do? Steal, kill, and what? 
destroyed. Let me read this sentence. I like what I wrote here. This spirit of addiction, this spirit of addiction is fed by, by the tormenting the person's thought life to engage addicted behavior that will always continue to grow and grow. It's never enough. That one drug is not enough. I need, I need more. I feel better when I have a little bit more. I, I'm, I'm more popular. Are, are people like me better when I take one more? Y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? Just one more. And, and, and by the way, this is a spiritual fight. Write this down. This is a spiritual fight. I want to show you how Paul, in this, his struggle of sin, in Romans chapter 7, verse 24. I just want to read these verses to you. I know I've got a lot of scripture verses here. Well, about 30 four scripture verses that we're looking at. So I find it to be a law that I want to do right, but evil's always lying right there by me. This is the Apostle Paul, right? Grace evangelist, soul winner, sold out, dies for the cause of Christ, knows what it is to pick up a cross, deny yourself, and to die. He understands this. Notice he still struggles with this, and especially, what's this, in the area of legalism. And, and, and this, and so he's always struggling with this because he's a man of law. And he thought law was, was the place of positioning him in the kingdom of God. And then all that became lies when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Amen? Aren't you glad? It sets us free, right? All right. Romans, let me read this to you. For I delight in the law of God, it's my inner being. But I see in my, all, my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my member. In my member. So he's talking about this addictive, the, the addictiveness, this, this lifestyle that he lived for all these years, and it's kind of pulling him back. And so there's a, there's a war going on, this addiction. Maybe not of drugs on this way, but this is his addiction, okay? Verse 24, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? Who's going to deliver me from this dilemma? And notice what he says in verse 27. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's who our deliverer is. Amen? He's the one that delivers us from the spirit of addiction. Now, I want to give you, it's not, in your, it's not on the screen. Yeah, it's on the screen, I think. But it's not in your notes. I want to give you some open doors to the spirit of of addiction. I wrote this Friday and I thought it was so important that we get some, 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 some meat on this bone, okay? The first one is I want to give you some open doors. Remember, we're talking about open doors that Satan, his demons cannot demonize us, torment us unless there's an open door, right? You got it? But we've all been affected by the spirit of addiction. And you may be in this room and you're, you're struggling with this area. And by the way, addiction doesn't have to be on drugs. It could be, it could be food. Now I'm meddling. It could be hobbies, you know. Uh, it, it could be those things that just anything that comes between you and God could be an addiction. It could be. I'll just let the Spirit of God deal with you, okay? Whatever it could be. And so, you know, when I was driving up here, I saw the car show up there. I, you know, the, I've always wanted to stop in and see those cars. I love old cars, you know. And uh, those old cars are my age now. That's, that's scary, isn't it, you know. <laughs> John, that's scary. It, it is scary because they're, you know, it's like I drove that car, and these are antiques, you know. But, but I've always wanted to stop there. But I, but I think, who are these people? Every time I drive by them, every first Sunday of the month, they show up down there. You know, I pray for those guys. And they just say, Lord, you know, just deal with them. You know, they're not in church. I want to be in church. You know, hear the word of God. I'm not saying they don't go. You, you, you don't hear me. I mean, hear me what I'm saying. All right, let me give you these three things. I'll shut up. First of all is delusion. Write this down. Delusion is this false, false belief system. Okay? In other words, spirit of addiction says, oh, that's not you. You're not hurting your family. It doesn't hurt anybody, it, you know. It's just between you and me. You know, we'll we'll keep this, you know. And 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 it doesn't hurt anybody. If nobody knows, it's all good. In Isaiah chapter forty-four, the prophet deals with with those who are serving, or literally physically serving idols. You know what the prophet said? He said, "You're so delu you have a delusionment of your heart so much that you don't even understand what's in your right hand as you serve those idols." And that's called delusionment. 
just a delusion. That spirit, that spirit of addiction also involved delusion. It's not that bad. It's okay to do that. Remember Eve? You know, it's okay. God didn't really say that, did he? Remember all the enticement? Look at that. Go ahead and look at that. It's good. Second one, secretly, secrecy. Life controlling pro this is a good statement. Life controlling problems grow in the soil of secrecy. Let me say it real slow. Life controlling problems grow in the soil of secrecy. You know what I'm talking about, you. Number three, isolation. Isolation is that spirit of addiction says, you know what? Not only do you do it's okay and and keep it a secret, but now you need to isolate yourself. And you, and you can sit in a pew, and it's like a it's like a phone booth, a private phone booth, and you can just build those walls up around you and, and smile and come into this place. But God wants to deliver you of any addiction in your life today. He does. I believe that. Whatever level it is, God wants to deliver you you of that. But what happens is we just want to isolate ourselves. Proverbs 18.1 says a man who isolates himself seeks his own desires and what's this? Enrages against wise judgment. You know what that means? Here's what that spirit of addiction does. You better keep this to yourself and don't let anybody find out. And you keep it to myself because what I do is my own business. And how I harm myself, that's my own business. And if you're in the fellowship of believers, it becomes our concern for your, your well-being. And so I, I want to encourage you not to just simply say, this is my deal. We, we're here as a place of refuge, a place of hope, of deliverance. Amen? And there's no judgment because every single one of us, you know, we've, we've got junk in our lives, right? So we're not here to judge. We're here to promote. Here's God's solution to those open doors. You ready? God's solution to delusion is the word of God, truth. Amen? Secrecy is the people of God. Hebrews 13.3 says that we're to encourage one another when we assemble ourselves together so that, watch this, there's a reason for that, so that no one will harden their heart. And that's what church is. We're to be a place where, where it's a place of refuge, a place of hope, or promoting, encouraging, so that you don't leave this place just a hardened heart, that your heart is softer because you've been in the presence of God, in the Word of God, in the fellowship of believers. Amen? That's the purpose here. Number next, isolation, Spirit of God. Nothing separates us from the love of God. The Holy Spirit is our guide and our, our watch over us. Okay? Number five, let's go to this one. That's our last one. Open doors to demons' intrusions is idle words. Idle words. I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will give account of every careless word they speak. I think we kind of skip over that sometimes, don't we? Yeah, because we, we look at some of our actions, we go, oh my goodness, I've done a lot of bad things, and surely my words won't matter. There's life and there's death in our words, right? Let me give you a list here. Constant negative talk, uncontrollable swearing, cursing people out, filthy talk, rude jokes, using the Lord's name in vain, being argumentative for the sake of being argumentative, and put downs. These are all out of words. Can we just be careful with our words? They hurt, don't they? You know that old, that old saying, sticks and stones, break my bones, the words never. That's just a cute little saying, but it hurts. That's just not true. It really does hurt. What? What? It's a lie. It is a lie because words do hurt. Every one of us has scar tissue about what somebody said, don't we? And we do. Can we just be careful what we speak over our children, over our grandchildren, with your husband or your wife in this church? Can we just be careful what we say and consider how the Spirit of God will deal with this? Because one day we'll stand before God and we will be judged. So how do we as believers, going back to what Paul said, believers of Christ keep the door shut to demons? You know what the easy answer is? If the devil's knocking, don't answer. <laughs> you know? I mean, just, 
You know, just don't answer. Remember, we looked at the book of James. It says, submit yourself to God. And what? Resist the devil. There's the door shutting. And what? And he will flee from you. But here's, here's the truth to all this, that Jesus, write this down, Jesus is our door. Amen. The third I am, there's seven, the third I am that Jesus said is, he says, I am the door. Not a door. Did you notice that? Church, come on. He doesn't say, I'm, I'm a door. I'm one of the ways. He says, I am what? I am the only way, right? I am the only door. There's no other way. Now, I want to show you something, and, and uh, I know my time is probably up. John chapter 10. Would you turn over there, John chapter 10? I want to show you something kind of cool here. I just can't let this go, this idea of just, he's a door? What, what does that mean? What? I have no idea what. I want, I want to show you something. John chapter 10. This is Jesus talking. Truly, truly. In other words, hey, hey guys, you better listen to this. This is the truth. Truly, truly, right? We, we don't say that. That's kind of unusual linguistics here. But. He's talking to these guys. He said, guys, I want you to get this because in a little while we're going to find they really didn't really understand. He's going to talk about something they all know, and I'm going to break that down for us just a little bit. But, but he says, this is the truth that I'm telling you, and I know you may not understand this because they didn't, but, but I'm telling you the truth, and it's going to be helpful as you live unto me. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he who does not enter the sheepfold, that's a sheep pen, okay, the, 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 where the sheep kind of hang out in a pen or gathered together. That's a sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way. That man is a what? A thief and a robber. In other words, he says, when somebody tries to break into the sheep and tries to go in a different way other than the door, climbs over or takes the wall down, we'll explain that in a minute, is, is not of me. He's trying to steal. He's trying to kill. He's trying to destroy but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. And let me stop right there. Now, that's what's a gatekeeper? So, so there's two different kinds of sheep holds, holding pens, if you would. Let's just call them sheep pens. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, we'll call them sheep pens. So the two different kinds. There's one in the city. So when a shepherd would come into a city, shepherds would, would take their sheep and guide them into the sheep holding pens. And all the sheep would gather. So there may be a, a shepherd's convention in Jerusalem. I don't know this. I'm making this up. So just go with me. And so all the different sheep would just kind of hang there and there would be a gatekeeper that would only allow shepherds who owned those sheep into that place. And that was his responsibility. And they'd put them in there and they'd take this big gate and they'd shut it tight and the gatekeeper would, would stay there until his shepherd would come to get the sheep. That's in the city. Okay, got that? So that's gatekeeper. There's another one in the country. I'll talk a little bit more about that. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. In other words, when the shepherd shows up, all right, the sheep hear his voice and the shepherd who's coming to get his sheep in the city calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Sheep know his name. I raise sheep. And they knew my voice. I could whistle. I could call them when I would come to the pens. And there's like 50 or 60 sheep out there in different pens. But my lamb knew my voice. And it's true. We don't fully understand it because we're not shepherds. Anybody took care of sheep before? Yeah, you did, didn't you? South Downs, Fine Wolves, whatever. Anyway, uh, he, now what's this? Verse 4. He has brought out all of his own and he goes before them and the sheep follow him. Why? Because they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of the stranger. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they didn't really understand what he was saying to them. So look at verse 7. So you got this idea so far? So in the city, sheep, shepherds bring all their sheep together and when it's time to leave the shepherd's convention, the shepherd goes to the gatekeeper. He says, I'm ready to get my sheep. He calls their name and they all follow him, just those sheep. And they know his voice. Another stranger may try to, uh-uh. Do you see the protection, the provision? What's this? Okay, verse 7. So Jesus said to them, to his disciples, truly, truly, listen up, boys. 
I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And all who came before me are thieves and robbers. So remember I've been telling you, when Jesus shows up, there is demonic dominion that's on rapid in this earth and deception and lies and stealing from, from God. When Jesus shows up, he says, I am the great shepherd. I've come to rescue you. And it's only by my, my presence and my being here that I am the door unto the sheep. Now watch this. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. Verse 9, here it is. I am, here's an, I am the third I am of the seven I am's. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be what? Saved and will be going in and out and find pasture because the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen? Amen. And then look at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd, notice what it says, lays down his life for his sheep. Lays down his life for his sheep. Three times Jesus says this in this story, that I lay down my life for my sheep. And the third one is, he says, I have authority. The fourth one is, I have authority to lay down my life. Now, why did he say that? We're on the other side of Calvary, so we know the Lamb of God who comes to take away man's son. We, we understand that. But he's speaking in this, in this linguistic form, in this way of ancient understanding that only shepherds and, and that ancient tradition, that culture would understand. So let me kind of break this down and help us understand. Why are we called sheep? Let me tell you why we're called sheep. Because of all, <laughs> speak for yourself. Of all, watch, of all the domestic animals in Jesus' day, of all the domestic animals, sheep are the most defen defenseless and helpless of all the creatures. They spend all their days just grazing with their heads down, not paying attention to what's going on around them. They have their heads down. The only thing they're interested in is that next blade of gla glass, next blade of grass that's going to go in their mouth. That's the only thing they're concerned about. So they keep their head down. They'd have no homing device in them. Most animals, you know, you've heard those stories where, you know, people move away and they forgot their dog. Now, who forgets their dog? That must be a country and western song. They forget their dog. You know, they forget their dog and their dog, you know, finds them, travels, you know, 500 miles or, you know, 20 miles. and find Sheep have no homing device. They have no idea. They can be across the street from their pens and their pasture. They will not know where to go. They're just that what? So here's what the sheep do. They just follow the crowd. They just, well, he's going there. I'm going there. Is it dangerous? Yeah. Sometimes they fall off a cliff because they're not paying attention. By the way, when a, when a, when, when a lamb falls into the water, they drown because their, their, their sheep, their wool gets wet and soaked down. But they're not going to swim. They just, I'm going to die. Yeah, they just die. Do you know a lamb will not drink out of a running water? You know, it has to be still. They're, they're afraid of running water. And that's why, you remember what Psalms 23? He said, he makes me to lie down in green pastures and he leads me by what? Still waters. Did y'all see that? There's a reason for that. Still waters, calming waters. Because you know what? Sheep, we don't know how to drink. That's what Jesus says, I am living water. And those who will come unto me will never thirst again. And out, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Amen? Aren't y'all glad? This, oh my goodness, this is, this is good preaching stuff here. <laughs> but there's also the thing about sheep. Wolf attacks. They will not defend themselves. They will not. They'll just run around. You know, they will not help another lamb. They'll not help another uh, uh, sheep, lamb. Also, sheep are totally dependent on the shepherd for protection, for care, for disease, for companionship. They know his voice. Now, shepherds off the time would not come to the city because, you know, the rains and would produce the grass and they would stay out in the fields. So how did they make holding pens out in the countryside? And this is the second part of that sheep hold, those sheep pens. Sometimes they would take brush 
and they would build a, a kind of a temporary pen or they'd use rocks or they'd use a backdrop of a hillside or, or a cliff and they would corral the sheep in there and they would contain those sheep and yet they would, there was a makeshift door and the makeshift door was not made out of wood or brush or stones. You know what the makeshift door was? He was a shepherd. The shepherd in that entryway into that makeshift countryside holding pen, he himself would lay down in that entryway to prevent any animals from coming in and any sheep from leaving. Any thieves that would come in to, to rob from that holding pen, that shepherd who laid down his life becomes the door of the shepherd, of the sheep. Do y'all see that? So th listen to me. As followers of Jesus Christ, those who believe and trust in giving up of yourself, we are assured of being in the fold, protected by our door, Jesus Christ. Notice what it says in the end in verses 27 through 30. And I close with this. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. They follow me. And I give them eternal life and they will never perish. For no one will what? Say this out loud, church. My Father who's given them to me is greater than all. Greater than who? He, he that is within you is greater than he that is in the world, right? Any demonic spirit that comes against you, you know the Spirit of God is greater in you than anything that comes against you. Amen? Why? Because you're strong? No. Because you have a, a degree in religion and Bible and theology? No. It's because Jesus is my door and my protector. And that's why. He's my protector. And no one is able to snatch him out of my Father's hand. Why? Because I am the Father and one. I am the Father and one. So how do we close the door? Jesus is the answer. If you've got some habitual sins that just haunt you, confess this. It may be anger. It may be lust. It may be covetedness. Whatever those those continual sins, those habitual sins just have lodged themselves, those strongholds. Do you know Jesus, if you're a believer, is, is your solution to resolve that? You may have familiar spirits of your family life. Maybe, maybe cancer has been a part of, of your family history or heart attacks or, or uh, alcoholism or whatever that is. Do you know that the Lord wants to deliver you today from that? He, he is that door. The one who closes those doors, those familiar spirits, past relationships, whether it's past friends or lovers or whatever in that past relationship, God wants to heal you and restore your soul as you confess that before him. Maybe there's some addictions. It may be, it may be some addictions that are so small, so new, but that's an addiction. And the Lord has spoken to you that this morning. I pray that God would reveal those things. That I'm not just going to just kind of get you in a headlock and say, you know, somebody's, I'm not doing that. I'm allowing, I want the Holy Spirit of God to speak to this. Or maybe it's just idle words. What is it? What has God spoken to you? Could we just take a moment, bow our heads? In the name of Jesus, in the name of of our shepherd in the name of the door the one who opens and closes doors by his authority could we just ask the, the Lord himself would, who is our door would shut the doors and create in us a clean renewed heart and soul who would lead us beside the still waters and fill us with the spirit of God would you pray a prayer of deliverance this morning? Whatever God has spoken to you and resolve that today because if you're a believer in Christ Jesus, that authority and power is within you. You just have to ask the Lord to initiate his healing, his deliverance in the name of Jesus. And don't allow Satan to deceive you to say, well, I've been doing this a long time. It's just something that's a part of my life. No, it's not. That's a lie from hell. Don't believe that. Today is a new day. You're a new creature. And he wants to restore you for whatever that is on your heart this morning. Father God, I thank you that you, through your Holy Spirit, speaking to those in this place. Father, you're a God of deliverance 
of anything that's come against your sheep. You will not allow a thief to come in and take any of your sheep, not even a portion of their wool or their health or their well-being. So right now, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ for those that are crying out for healing, deliverance, forgiveness, that you'll hear their cry and restore them. And the Father, they'll be faithful to remain in the sheepfold under your care and not to venture outside of your watch, your care, in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this teaching today. I thank you for the word of God that brings life and liberty. And Father, like Paul, we struggle in so many different ways, but you bring us that law of perfect liberty by your word and by your presence, and by your spirit. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. Amen. There you go. We're not done with, with this, but uh, we're, we're going to move on to another topic. And uh, I'm not sure where I'm going to go with this. I've got a couple things that I'm working on, but uh, we'll go from there. We take communion every Sunday if you're visiting with us. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we invite you to participate uh, in this. Jesus said, I am, I am the bread of life, didn't he? And as we take this, we're reminded of just the sovereignty of God in our life and the celebration that that he destroyed all the works of of any demons that come against us. Amen. Aren't you glad about that? And as we take this, we're just we're just in agreement with God about his covenant relationship with us. It brings healing and restoration. So uh, we're going to take communion now. And so we're just going to ask the Lord to, to bless this at this time. Can we do that? Sure. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the bread, for the cup that represents the blood of Jesus Christ, the covenant that comes in knowing you and being known in our lives. We thank you for this, and we celebrate this time individually and corporately as a church. We recognize that you're the giver of life, and not only that that life that sustains us, but that abundance that comes in knowing you. So we, we ask you to bless this cup. In this bread, we ask this in Jesus' name we pray together.